we are always ready, right? Okay. No problem. And, and I can see Jürgen that uh, that we are both <laughs> in the in the Seattle area. I don't yeah. know if you if you recognize my background. <laughs> yeah, I do. I do. I do. I do. Yeah. You it's flew curls, to America right? together or something. Yeah. <laughs> For, for those of you who, who don't know this place, this is actually a uh, a bar where we uh, where most of the MVP ah, is is me. Yeah, it is. It's Joey's. Joey's. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking it actually was Earl's with the window. Oh, okay. uh, it, it's actually Joey's. <laughs> it's been too long. Now. Let's 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 hope we can go there next year then. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> we 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 don't care about the technical stuff as long as we can go to Joey's. That's uh, just the that's, beers. <laughs> okay, let me see if I can share my screen. Will you start sharing? I think. Can you Next. see it? Absolutely. Yeah. All good. Good. Okay. Well, uh, thank you all for first of all to the to the event for for having us. Uh, uh, we will talk about Windows servicing in this uh, weird world that we live in, working from home. Uh, it's not only related to to actually working from home. It's it's actually more of a general general challenging about these uh, servicing and feature updates and how we get these machines uh, up to date and secure uh, in in the world where where people are working from home and of course uh, during this uh, this time and this pandemic. More and more people has been working from home, and that has also caused some some challenges and some things that that needed to be modified just slightly. I think that's fair to say, don't you think, Jürgen? Absolutely. We'll yes. try to cover the <laughs> never-ending story with end-user downtime and and what's actually is important when we do this stuff, right? Because exactly. we want the users to be productive as well. So basically, yeah. it's uh, uh, um, Windows 10 servicing with the touch of work from home. Yeah, we have a lot of stuff to cover, but uh, on you know, fortunately, we have the we have the last session of the day, so uh, so we will just continue all night. No, I'm just kidding. We will we will try to remain on track. Um, but before we begin, let just introduce myself if I can get my keyboard to work. My name is uh, Ronnie. I'm a Microsoft MVP in the enterprise mobility space, based in Denmark and. I've been doing endpoint management for close to 20 something years, and I've been an MVP for close to 15 years. And uh, this is how you reach me. And with me today, I have my good Swedish friend. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, my name is Jorgen. I live on in Sweden, as south as you can come, basically. Just I can five minute walk and then, I, then I'm at the bridge to Denmark, so really close to Copenhagen. But right now it could be just like 100 miles anyway, because it's like an iron fortress to get over the bridge with these COVID restrictions. So that's bad. Um, I always wanna... Yeah, Copenhagen Sorry. has never been more safe than it is now with the bridge <laughs> to Sweden being closed. So. <laughs> oh, okay. so that's the problem with living in Skåne, right? down in Sweden. All the rest of Sweden calls us half Danes and the Danes don't want us either. So basically no one wants us. That's how that's how we have it seen down here. So. <laughs> uh, and I have the great pressure, pleasure presenting to you today as well with Ronnie and you can reach me here and um, yeah. yeah, we'll ask, we'll answer any question you have. Absolutely. That is a big promise. Yep. OK, so uh, the challenges that we will be covering today is uh, what are the challenges and, and what we need to, to look into on the infrastructure and, and, and on what we need to improve. What can we do to make the odds better for these uh, updates to, to go through and be successful and communicating with end users? And then basically we are looking at three uh, main scenarios. We are using the pure online version using Microsoft Windows Update for Business or Intune, if that's basically it's the same thing. And we will look about the traditional uh, servicing using TAR sequences. If you are a config manager customer, you've most likely been doing that for, for years. And then Jürgen has a new way of doing things. Well, actually Microsoft has released something with servicing, and I think Jürgen has optimized it just a little bit. So hopefully this is what we will cover today. So let's get started. You know, 
Yeah, well, uh, this is this is the servicing thing, and the the, <laughs> the thing looks looks really strange. And it, during the pandemic, everybody has been working from home, and we have seen these uh, strange faces. And hopefully, this is something that <laughs> that we don't have to see so far uh, so much anymore. Um, some of the challenges when we work from home or when people are working remotely in generally, this is not only something that is related to the pandemic, is, is network consideration. And uh, when uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, a lot of people were moved to home and, and uh, com companies might have, you know, VPN connections that were, you know, targeted for maybe five, maybe 10 percent at peaks. When, uh, when people were working remotely and all of a sudden they went to like maybe 90 or 100% people being remote. So of course the, the, the equipment and the internet connections and all of that were, were, were busted because they were running, you know, kind of force tunneling because, you know, nobody was, was working remotely. So, so some of the things that we really need to, to look into is to make sure that if you are working remotely and if you are working with a VPN tunnel, um, that you make sure that the traffic going to Microsoft is directed directly to Microsoft and not through the, the corporate network. Um, this is not just related to, to patching, but especially if you're talking technologies like Teams, uh, video, audio conferencing, you know, meetings like this. If, if you have to redirect everything through a single VPN concentrator or firewall, it might be a really, really, really bad and poor experience. So this is something that we uh, that uh, that we need to uh, to look into. If we um, if we look at content location, where are the clients downloading from? Have we activated, you know, peer to peer sharing? That might be a good idea if everybody is working in the office. It might be a very bad idea if people are working using a VPN tunnel and working from home cloud management gateways, communicating, uh, updating, and how do we support the end users if the upgrade fails, recovery, provision, deployment. This is some of the challenges that we will look into today. Network considerations, let me just um, uh, move to my, uh, I have a web browser here where you can, where you can see this article where you can optimize the VPN traffic. Microsoft has actually released a, a full configuration part for profile for your VPN clients if you're running always on or something similar to that with all the URLs and VPNs uh, or IP addresses that needs to be uh, to be whitelisted so you don't have to go and and build these solutions yourself it's it's really really e easy and simple to uh, to uh, to adopt and this is something that will improve your your network speed with uh, yeah, with a lot. So definitely this is something that you need to, to look into and, and, and check out. Content location is a, a huge challenge, uh, especially if we are talking about the, the old versions of the, the feature updates. Uh, if you're downloading using Microsoft uh, Update for Business, well, then basically you're getting everything from the online. So basically this is just um, uh, the, all you need to do is to make sure that you are not downloading through the, the, the corporate network. If you're using task sequences to upgrade your, your machines uh, in the traditional way, uh, it's, it's usually something that uh, requires that you download the full media. And if people are working from home, they might have slow connections and, you know, is this something that we need to download three, four, five, whatever gigabytes using the, the VPN connections, or should we implement a, a CMG? Windows servicing is, uh, is optimized uh, a little bit uh, regarding to the content, but Jürgen will get into that uh, in, uh, in, uh, at the end of the session. The scripted solutions out there is, is we have seen some really, really, really strong uh, solutions. And uh, I think they were great at the time, but uh, right now I actually think that the built-in solution is actually covering most of the scenarios that we need today. We asked the community uh, a couple of months ago so what they are using. And as you can see, most customers today are still using the task sequences. Uh, config manager servicing is growing rapidly. We should actually have done this again, Jürgen, because maybe the numbers has actually changed now. I think it will soon. change as well. We should do it like we, next week or something. Yeah, absolutely. So, so this is basically what you know. Uh, it's based on 129 votes, so it's probably not uh, the whole truth, but it's it might be close to to what we see out there. 
So what can we do to uh, to improve our odds? Well, first of all, uh, some of the things that are really challenging when you are changing the version of, of Windows is that uh, your drivers, your buyers and everything is might not be uh, supported uh, on the new version of Windows. So please make sure that everything is, is updated and, and up to date. We can have unsupported or applications that needs to be uninstalled and removed. How do we deal with pending reboots? Uh, especially, we, we, we have we've had these issues for years, but especially when people are working from home, they never, literally never reboot their machines. And, and, and pending reboots might cause that these updates will never get installed. So this is something that we need to, to verify and make sure that these machines actually get rebooted if needed so they can get the updates. Missing security updates, uh, CU updates, uh, of course, is also an issue. And of course, language packs is something that we need to deal with. So if we look at the, the, the buyers and driver management, there's some really great tools out there that, uh, that is uh, super easy to, to work with. Uh, one of my favorite tools, I can just, let me see if I have my, I have a machine running here with something. This tool from the, uh, from the guys over at the msnpointmanager.com site, they have a, it's a, it's built by Maurice and it's branded with the with the with their site, but basically what this is this is something that uh, can automatically build and deploy and update drivers. This is still needed if you want to support all your bare metal and OS deployments, and it can also be used to especially update uh, drivers, but also BIOS versions on the machines. But we, what we are starting to see now is that more and more vendors, Microsoft has been working very close with um, with a lot of uh, with a lot of vendors, let me just see if I can find this uh, script here. As you can see, HP has started to uh, to release both drivers, but also uh, firmware BIOS updates using Microsoft Update for Business. And this is really, really, really interesting. And this is one of the main reasons that I think you should move away from the traditional task sequencing updates, because if you do servicing, if you do Windows Update for Business, you will actually get drivers updated as part of the feature update uh, experience. So you don't need to, to, to manually manage these drivers. Lenovo has also started to, to release these updates. So this is this is something that Microsoft is pushing really, really, really hard with both Lenovo, HP, and, and, and Dell, and of course also uh, uh, Microsoft's uh, own uh, uh, drivers for their for their hardware models. If if you want to 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 script these solution and, and, and download the drivers uh, directly from Microsoft, you can actually do this using a script. I, I, I think I might have a slide on this uh, later on, but this is a, this is a script here that um, was, let me put it, I have a I have a, an old article here by our fellow MVP, Roger Sanders from, from Switzerland, who, who wrote this in 2017. And this was actually something that we have used with customers to if they have a let's say you have a customer with a lot of different hardware models and you want to update those and um, and uh, and you don't want to build uh, driver packages and etc for 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 everything then you can simply push out drivers directly from Microsoft so so this script that you see here is is really 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 heavily inspired by this article but basically what you can see here on on my device here if I run the first part of the script, it will basically just check what my machine is, uh, check directly from Microsoft Update what drivers is actually um, required. And as you can see, it finds, uh, in this case, two drivers that is available for my machine. And then I can go in and say, hey, let's uh, let's download these drivers from uh, from Microsoft, and, uh, and it will. And at the end of the, the script here, you can automatically install and uh, and require or not require a reboot depending on what you will you can see here download is well uh, zero or two of two so let let's let's just kick this off and see what happens so now it will install the drivers on my NUC, so hopefully uh, I will survive I have no idea of course I haven't tested this <laughs> because it's kind of hard to test. Oh, it's no problem. I can continue <laughs> the session without you running. So. Yes, so we will see what happens. Yeah. But as you can see, these drivers has now been installed. I can run the 
I can run the scan part here again. Uh, let me just do this one. And let's see what happens if we run this again. Hopefully I will not have these two drivers missing. I might have it if it requires a reboot. I I, uh, I I don't know. I haven't tested, but as you can see, hey, now I don't have any missing drivers. So so this is this is really really really. Let me just run this just in case. No, this is fine. So so now my machine has been updated without me having to manage and and maintain these uh, these drivers. So this is a solution that is well. Uh, Super simple to deploy. You can you can deploy this using Intune. You can deploy this using Config Manager. You can use deploy it using whatever. We have customers with up to eighteen thousand devices that is actually using a simple script like this to update the majority of their PCs. So so this is actually something that can be done in 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 the real world. Here is some screenshots. Another thing that we are struggling with is the is the pending reboots and. Uh, our good friend and fellow MVP Martin Bengtsson, also based in Denmark, has built this uh, this tool called uh, Toast Notification, which basically can be used to communicate with the end user when they need to upgrade, but also when the machines need to restart or if you want to offer basically anything to the end user. It is a super simple and 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 easy to brand. Uh, solution that he has built. So you basically just go in and modify the XML file, and this can be deployed using Config Manager, using Intune, Hybrid, you know, all kinds of scenarios. And basically what we can do here is that we can tell the user, okay, you have a pending reboot, you have a security reason for you need to restart or whatever you have been, you know, uh, not restarting for, for 30 days or whatever. So this is a, a great solution. So let's go in and look at the Microsoft update for business. So if we are running a cloud native security solution and uh, we want to update these devices, uh, Windows update for business might be, uh, or it is actually the only supported solution for Microsoft, but it also is something that we will see hopefully more and more organization moving to this path uh, moving forward. So updates is not something that we need to worry about. It is just something that is happening completely automatically, exactly like we do with our phones and, and stuff like this. So the process is that you really, really, really have a simple management. And uh, the cool thing, and, and this is actually something that I am a really fan of. It, it took me a while to understand it in the beginning because I was uh, hit by this, but Microsoft will actually hold back these updates for devices that might cause issues. So with the feature update uh, that was released a year ago, Microsoft actually didn't release those for the Surface Books because they had some Bluetooth issues uh, and they wanted to fix these be before the, uh, the update was released to these machines. So, so if you have a device or a driver or whatever on your on your machine that they know from from other customers are, are causing issues then basically they are holding back these updates until they have a solution and actually can also update the driver as part of that uh, that upgrade so this hopefully will give the end user a much 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 better experience so this is really really good we also have some limitations around the control and we cannot postpone updates forever like we can with config manager but then again who would like to you know postpone an update for more than a year if you have an issue that is taking you more than a year to solve then you might have a have a have, a, have another issue Reporting is probably the worst part about uh, going uh, pure cloud, but uh, we'll get back to that in, in just a second. Feature updates, it's still the reporting, it's still a preview, blah, 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 and there is some settings that you need to to uh to, to set but 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 it's 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 really really simple. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> because I was just about to ask how long it's been in here. Preview. In preview, yeah, well, it's, it's like been a preview. five years or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, th this is a really, really sad story. But but at the end of the day, um, it is working for a lot of customers, and for some customers, of course, it's it's not the uh, it's not the right uh, it's not the right way to do it. But one of the important thing is that you know, doing your normal updates, feature updates, needs to have a deferral period of zero. Let me just 
go back to my um, to my environment here. I have it here somewhere. Yes. If I go to my uh, my Intune uh, setup and go to devices and update rings, here we go. Uh, you can see I have two simple rings, test and 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 production. So if I go to to my my update ring, you can see here that the deferral for feature updates needs to be set to zero days. Otherwise, the feature updates uh, functionality will not work. And then uh, I need to go to my uh, feature updates, uh, which you can see is <laughs> in preview. And basically, all you need to do here is to specify the devices that needs to be targeted. Boom, in this case, all my devices. And then I need to specify what version of Windows that I want to uh, that I want to stage on. Uh, right now, uh, we have just uh, had the release of uh, 21 uh, H1, so we will deploy that in just a second. The reporting part is uh, well. Well, let let me just show you something that is pretty new. Um, the, I, this has nothing to do with feature updates, but I, I think it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> the, the the quality updates uh, for um, for um, for Windows updates. One of the things that customers has been struggling with is, let's say that Microsoft is releasing a new uh, update that is a zero touch, or not, not a zero touch, but a zero day uh, uh, vulnerability. That and you really need to deploy this now, and we really need to ignore all the. Uh, restart settings and and all that, but we really need to get it out there. And then Microsoft has released this uh, this feature, I think, a couple of weeks ago, um, where you can go in and and select the update that you want to uh, that you want to deploy, and and then you can actually specify the numbers of days that the clients uh, can. Can can hold back the the restart. So if you really want this update up right now, then you can simply say zero days, and then they will be prompted to 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 reboot immediately. The B here is 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 basically just specifying that it was released as part of the Patch Tuesday. If you have something that is released outside of the Patch Tuesday ring, it will most likely be uh, having an A here. I haven't seen any uh, since this was released, but this is this is what the documentation states that it that it will. So this is uh, this is super cool. If we go to reporting uh, and see what uh, what's available in here. Uh, you can see that our uh, normal uh, Windows updates uh, contains all our uh, errors. No, let me just do this in, in this lab instead because this is has some easier numbers. We, um, we, we have another tip there as well. Deploy the update rings to a users and the feature update to devices because the update ring to device will break the autopilot experience. Unfortunately, so yes. you will get the second log on. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, that makes it a little bit messy that you need to target user and devices with different settings. Yeah, correct. Um, let me find this. I was going to show you Windows updates. Yes, here you can see my uh, my feature updates and my uh, my ring deployment and what version they are running on. If I go to reports and dig into the feature reports, I can select my deployment ring and here I can actually follow what updates are being installed on, on what machines and um, and uh, I, I think actually this is this is OK for now. Uh, I have also seen some issues where, uh, let's say, machines are running an, a later version. If you're uh, if you're running, it will actually uh, show up with some with some conflicts here. And as you can see, the scan time here is is not really super reliable. But but at the end of the day, it's 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 a a good, okay overview. If you want to, if you want to dig into something else, you can enable uh update uh compliance uh, this one uh, you've probably seen this before but it's it's still available and you can go in and see hey okay what are the what is the status of my devices you can see i have three machines running on the latest version 
12 machines running on 20H2 and 19, oh, two machines on, on, the, on, on, on 1909. And, and, and this, is, this is probably a little bit better. The Microsoft has recently, like you know, two weeks ago, changed uh, some updates. So if you are running update compliance today, this uh, this setting needs to be uh, to specify it, and uh, if you if you set up your your environment uh, uh, before May 10th, and basically what you can do is that you can rerun your configuration script, or you can go in and, and set a policy on uh, using uh, CSP that will uh, that will fix this. But if you're using update compliance, this is something that you need to uh, yeah, that you need to understand and and, and fix. Any additional comments you have on that, Jürgen? If I move on. No, nope. no. Nope. We are we are discussing uh, <coughs> SMS and uh, configuration manager in the chat during the time. So, <laughs> okay. is it is it good? Well, Absolutely. the end when when you enable Windows Update for Business and and manage this using Intune. Uh, of course, uh, end users will not see the screen. They will basically get this uh, notification that an update needs to be installed, and then they can install it. If you are moving from 19, whatever, and, and up to 20 H1, then you will have this experience. It will take roughly 30 minutes, depending on your, on your device, uh, to reboot the machine. But if you are running 21, H1, and you are coming from uh, one of the two latest version of Windows, uh, you will be using something else that will make this process a lot easier. And I don't want to take all the thunder away from <laughs> Jürgen, so, so I will just uh, leave it that way. But some of the stuff that, that Jürgen will show you on, 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 on how fast this can go, this will actually also happen with, uh, with update uh, for business. Uh, if you are updating to um, to 21 H1, good. And I have some videos here. I don't want to show that. Uh, reporting, I think. Yeah, you showed it. Showed before. that. And okay. With that, did I? A. I almost made it on time. I can you... start sharing instead. So it's easier to switch now. It is. I'll take over the chat. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Um, it was about uh, first loves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, I hope you can see it now. So let's go over to configuration manager and uh, world where many of us still exist in, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, depending on where you are. Um, so boundaries in work from home era. Microsoft actually, I think that's really cool as well. Microsoft actually switched focus as soon as the pandemic hit and they actually um, re reprioritized everything they did in configuration manager. So they put things that they were planning on the shelf and then they um, prioritized things that could help people in the new world we will be facing like this one. Uh, where we actually all of a sudden has a, have a VPN boundary, which we actually can let out to detect VPN if we like. Uh, that's actually a really cool thing as well. Uh, so I mean that there, there was a lot of work done to help us uh, be as productive as we could as well uh, during the pandemic from Microsoft as well. Um, and the same thing we can, um, and another tip is of course turn off peering. Um, we see that a lot still that they you you use um, uh, always on VPN and you've configured peering and yeah then we peer um, and that's uh, maybe not a good ex uh, good thing right on our VPN boundary um, and we can of course use our preferred sources so this was I think when the pandemic hit I think we got like 25 questions from different customers on how should we configure our boundaries now is this the correct way of getting things through Windows Update so I mean we really pushed everything and, and as Ronnie said before uh, I think like I think nine of ten customers switched to um, a split tunnel uh, when this hit instead of forced tunnel because they were more or less forced to uh, so that's also a good, good, good thing in the future where we're going as well. Um, 
cloud management gateway then. We call it the number one COVID-19 tool for MCM admins. That's a long sentence. Um, we actually, is, again, we deploy the CMG to customers um, uh, a lot just to fix VPN <laughs> because we had a lot of customers. Yeah, in the middle of the pandemic. So we need to switch our VPN solution because our licenses has changed and so on and so on. And then CMG is amazing. Uh, so we can actually run scripts to fix everything uh, to get them up and running again with VPN. Um, so that's actually uh, great. Uh, so we'd actually deploy it just to fix VPN for some customers as well. Uh, so cloud management gateway is something we all always should have. Um, absolutely. Um, Task sequences then. The, we've been doing task sequences for deploying feature updates for like the last five years. Um, so we're not going to cover that that more than this. Um, uh, many of us use a pre-staged task sequence or we pre-stage the uh, image or we pre-stage the task sequence. So we have it locally. We run um, uh, uh, tests set up before and so on and so on. Uh, Gary Block and Mike Terrell, they made an amazing work on putting this together as a document. It's also quite complex, uh, but grab things from it. It's 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 amazing. Uh, a really great job they've done. Uh, but we're not going to talk more about test sequences because that's not what we want, where we want to go, because the, the, we will come to the, in the end to why test sequences are not um, uh, not OK for 2021 anymore. Um, even if there's a lot of uh, things being done there. Um, so let's look at Windows 10 servicing in configuration manager. Then. Uh, there was a lot of improvements in 20, 2010. There are some few improvements in 2103 as well. Um, but it, these improvements, basically they will show you the setup diag failure error code if you have an, a failure in when you deploy it. Um, but it only works on Windows 10, 20 or 4 or later because set that that's the only version that contains setup diag built in. Before that, we needed to run it um, on our own. Um, we always, I always try to extend inventory and collect the setup diag information as well. Um, after even if it's successful or not successful because we can still get a lot of information which version did this machine come from what's the, what was the blocker and so on and we can inventory that in configuration manager uh, so have a look at that as well uh, but when we do servicing uh, what is really servicing then well basically servicing there are some examples you i think this one was one of the first first posts about it basically you basically servicing contains the ESD file and an exe file called Windows Update box.exe. Uh, so basically you can if you look in a folder when you up the, uh, download the Windows 10 servicing version in configuration manager, you will see these two files, for example. You can actually run these three commands. Uh, update pre-download quiet, update install quiet, and these two commands can be run without um, the end user even knowing and without the reboot. It's only the last one that will force the reboot and actually the actual upgrade to take place. And that's a big thing, right? Because if we do this, because the biggest downside with the task sequence is that it, it runs in the end user's face and it takes way too long time. If we use the power of the task sequence, for example, we could still use these commands instead of doing everything in in your face on the user because that's not what we want we want our users to be productive um, that's the most important thing so if you haven't tested this out test it out um, note that microsoft updates the windows update box sometime as well so we need to update it if you pull it to an application instead um, but it's actually a really cool way of doing it as well uh, so what's dynamic updates then? I think dynamic updates is basically when we, again, when we did a task fix, task sequence parts, we always run a test uh, 
test the setup and see if there's a blocker and then we manage the blocker. Well, basically dynamic updates is basically it will contact Microsoft, download everything in I like if there's a driver that fixes a block, uh, it will also be downloaded dynamically. Uh, so that's that's a big win as well. So if we can get rid of all the um, all the things we need to do ourselves and then let this happen on its own, that's also a good thing. Uh, you can read a bit more about dynamic updates here as well. Uh, so how can we run commands pre post feature updates then? Because that's one of the reasons, as Ronnie said, we use test sequences, right? We run, uh, we want to uninstall something. We want to install something. We want to fix something. We want to uninstall built in apps. We want to uh, deploy a new start menu, custom background, whatever we like. Um, we can do that in two ways. Either way is to set up config.ini, which I always do because we can control much more things there as well. Or we can simply put the files in the folders using this as well. Um, using a GUID and then pre install, pre commit, and success. So, so we can do that as well. I like to set up config because it's been around forever and we can control basically everything in it. Uh, here's the link to what you can do with uh, custom actions and how they're <coughs> configured. So. so, I would say that. Any way we go, set up config.ini is your new best friend. Uh, if you look at the, this example here, we can actually ignore compatibility. That's only warnings and then let it let it upgrade take place anyway. We can turn on a dynamic updates. We can uh, turn on and off telemetry. We can change the priority if we like. So we we still have a lot of control and basically we only need to ditch that that INI file in the folder call called, um, yeah, it's a long path, right? And I I use this for my modern client as well. Uh, so let's see if I still have my browser open or we can do it here. Uh, so if we look at one of my modern machines uh, and Windows, I have my folder, which I copy using Win32 app, advanced IPU, and here I can run pre and post commands even in if I'm in modern management. So even I, if I let Ronnie's feature update target the machine, I can still run uh, pre or post commands on the machine and do whatever I like. In this case, I remove some apps, uh, put back some branding and do some other stuff as well. Um, I will blog that as well, but it's very easy as well to get it done right. Yeah, so that's a good thing. Uh, so even in the modern world, this is an option as well. Uh, in Configuration Manager, we've got the new option as well uh, of using the ESD instead of using the IPU source. Uh, however, when as soon as we select the feature update instead of our updated IPU source media, which most likely is more than five gigs, it will always run dynamic updates. But if we control it, just back one step, just put the setup config.ini there and it will be honored by this feature in the task sequence as well. So we can still use, so we can still have control uh, of some parts and then we can still use the task sequence for what task sequence is good at as well. Um, so that's a good, that's a new uh, again. And the biggest thing is basically the size, I would say, to get the size down on the ISO. So what can we do to do this a little bit more advanced than as Ronnie promised? Well, basically uh, my colleague has put together a community tool that we call IPU installer and actually one called deployment scheduler, but that's really not needed. Uh, so IPU installer will use basically everything we talked about. It will use the setup config.ini. We have error handling and it will run basically the Windows update box commands in the background. Uh, and we can still do here. I have a lot of things as I'm on premise instead. Here I do remove apps, welcome screen, start menu, start menu files, um, and import layout, everything. So we can do whatever we like. We can also pre state drivers in this one as well. And, and, uh, and we do that with the simple task sequence. Just say put the driver in the folder, use our normal driver package, uh, query on it, and then it will that it will actually either we put it here or we just put it in the client cache 
the IPU installer will actually search through the whole um, configuration manager client cache looking for a WIM file with the drivers if you use that or just put it like this, then it will find it as well. Um, and the end user experience which we are after is that we can do uh, this is where this is the little notification we do. Now we started doing this without any notification. We just run it because as you will see, the speed is quite nice. Uh, so we can customize any, everything we like. It copies the branding from Software Center um, and we can hide everything here if we like as well. And I can schedule my own upgrade. I can save it when it suits me. Uh, so I can say that I want to run it in like five minutes. Um, and then it's scheduled, right? And then we say, OK, close it down. Then I actually time lapse this a bit, so it will actually prompt me really fast. So that's really uh, five minutes fast. And then we'll give me a countdown. Now it's time to upgrade. You can either abort or you have five minutes to, to do it or a re abort if you like. And all the text can be customized and it actually doesn't take 30, 60 minutes. It's only in the background. So this is actually a good thing, right? So, OK, let's uh, let's let's wait for it to start. Um, and then again, I've cheated again. So if we look at the time, it will actually run really fast. Uh, and then it will run in the background saying that it will actually upgrade a process machine in the background and that takes a while uh, because it will do dynamic updates update whatever it needs update everything and then finally it will prompt the end user to reboot the machine um, and that's actually where it's uh, uh, where it's actually is a good thing so if we compare this with uh, with the task sequence for example where we do everything in your face here we can do like two thirds in the background um, and, and the counter, I think this is the way we should increase the speed of the servicing process as well. Uh, so it actually, I've actually cheated a bit, but it actually takes, when it actually reboots, it takes, this is the real time, right? So I think it takes like a couple of minutes only before it's up and running again. Uh, not that fast though, uh, but it, it takes a couple of minutes. We actually put together the time as well. Uh, so this is the time we have, right? So if we look at the task sequence uh, option, I just took a normal task sequence without anything strange. It took the total time was uh, 26 minutes and the reboot time was 26 minutes. But the actually downtime for the end user is 26 minutes, right? Uh, for the feature update, we can, from the work from home, we can actually pull the content from Microsoft if we don't use force tunneling, of course. Uh, but it will take a long, much longer time because it will pre-stage everything and do dynamic updates and everything in the background. The reboot time is four minutes. So we actually have, if, if my end user can work all this time, this time, we can actually save 22 minutes of anger and frustration. And that's basically why we did the IPU installer tool because that will give you the best of both worlds. So it will do everything in, in this scenario, 24 minutes reboot time of five minutes and the end user downtime of five minutes. And that's actually uh, amazing, I think. And in this case, I actually used an updated WIM file, so that's why I didn't use dynamic updates. Then it will take longer as well. But that's not the big point. What, what we are doing at customers now, we actually ditched telling them what's happening because it only takes four or five minutes and then uh, deploy it straight off as a normal update in a patch Tuesday or in in that time frame uh, so they are actually forced to upgrade and that's where we want to go in the future I think we I mean the for me the end user experience is if we work with client management the end user experience is the number one thing for us if we can get the end user to be happy that's the biggest thing we can do security is of course the second one but in many cases we want to do things I, I hear people saying, "Yeah, we we do this because it's easier for us as, um, in IT," and that I think that time is gone with the new requirements people are expe expecting from their uh, IT department to deliver. Uh, so, what's the future of servicing then? That's what Ronnie talked about this for before. So, what's an enablement package? This is actually the really cool way. So, in the in even if we go from 
20H2 to 21H1. We actually get all the files and all the content downloaded in, uh, in say, the April update or March or April update. And then it's actually dormant until you just say, OK, switch. And then it basically switches. Uh, how will this be handled in the future? Well, we had a Twitter conversation, so I actually hijacked that picture. Uh, where uh, one of the Microsoft guys re re replies that I think it's a safe bet that 21H2 will be available through an enablement package as well. Of course, that's his opinion, but I'm still saving that tweet. If can be useful in autumn if it's not, I'm thinking. Um, but I truly hope so as well. So I'm 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 with uh, him on this one. I truly truly hope that we can get it like this because this is the end user experience in that scenario instead. Basically, the 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 file is like 30k. It's like 30 kilobytes. So this basically takes long time because configuration manager needs to verify everything and hash everything and do everything. But basically, we we get to. I think on my Lenovo, it took like 30 seconds to reboot the machine and I'm on 21 H1. So I truly hope this is the way going forward. No more end user downtime. We get the drivers and BIOS updates from Windows Update for Business, but controllable through Intune. Um, and we move that workload to Intune and then we can still block, say, a BIOS upgrade that interferes with something we do. Uh, and then uh, and then we are in a much happier place than we are now. Um, so this is actually amazing that it actually can take <coughs> a configuration manager uh, like a minute to install uh, 25 kilobytes. But then again, it's because it needs to hash everything. And yeah, you know the drill. So to actually restart of this, this is a machine going from 2004, I think it was, to 21H1. So this is not time lapse. So this is the end user experience, and this is this is how we want to do it in the future. So I mean, start. I mean, testing applications and upgrading them during the the the. And we see that a lot as well. That they people you upgrade BIOS and drivers when you do a feature update. That should be done before as one. Well. <coughs> and if we do that before, then we get this end user experience as well. So it only takes like 25, 30 seconds to reboot the machine and I'm upgraded. You will have much, much happier end users. Um, so that's basically our summary, right, Ronnie? Update drivers of BIOS before servicing. That makes it so much easier to troubleshoot the process and will increase the success rate uh, enormously and actually give you a more stable machine before the feature upgrade as well. Um, uh, so in an earlier presentation, I think we had an example from a customer that they actually benchmarked their uh, issues uh, or they had serviced as tickets that was caused by a bad driver and then just by updating them before, got a lot of less uh, service desk calls. Uh, keep it simple, use Microsoft security features. Um, that's still a problem with third party, both some antiviruses, most have a... Um, uh, adopt adapted. We shouldn't mention any names, but uh, same for disk encryption. Um, it's much easier if you use the built-in ones. Uh, if you're using configuration manager, you really need a CMG. Uh, it will give you another tool in the toolbox to troubleshoot machines, run script on them, and so on. Otherwise, uh, so so to make it to make your life easier and again a more happy end user. Uh, split tunneling is an enabler, not just for work from home, but I think for the future where we can pull much more content directly from Microsoft and uh, um, yeah, we'll see. Uh, there's a lot of things coming as you saw on build, win, get this in uh, GA and so on and so on. So things will things will evolve in this uh, section as well. And I think split tunnel is an enabler for the future as well. Uh, look at transitioning to Windows Update for Business or Windows Servicing. That's basically controlled by your reporting needs. And you should really have a look at 
it especially when going to 21H1, so you don't have to have that long bad experience. <sighs> so that's basically uh, a couple of minutes run over, but I hopefully you had the time and thought it was worthwhile. So if there's any other questions, um, just feel free to uh, unmute and ask them. Um, otherwise, I think it's beer time, right? Yeah, it is. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Great session, guys. Really yeah, interesting. Thank you. Uh